Pontiac is widely credited with giving birth to the muscle car movement when it shoved its famous 389 V8 into the GTO in 1964. Keith Dorton, owner of Automotive Specialists, is building a classic 389 with a few modern upgrades that should help it produce well over the advertised 215 to 360 max horsepower of the original engines. And that's good because this engine won't be going into a lightweight GTO, but a 1955 Pontiac Safari station wagon, so it's going to need some oomph. This engine will be bored and stroke from the original 4.0625 inch bore and 3 inch 750,000 stroke to a 4 inch 155,000 bore and 4 and a quarter inch stroke, bringing total displacement to 461 cubic inches. To fill those big cylinder bores, Dorton is using a set of off the shelf pistons from Molly. With a flat top and generous valve pocket, remember these are cost effective shelf stock pistons. The compression ratio will be a relatively mild 9.7 to 1, which will help keep the engine safe from detonation while hauling around a relatively heavy car and burning pump gas. The rings are a lightweight, low tension package from Molly and measure up at 1 millimeter for the top and second rings and 2 millimeters for the oil ring. These pistons use a low drag floating pin design and there is enough compression distance on the pistons that the pin board does not intrude into the oil ring groove, which means a support rail isn't required. Those eight pistons are attached to a set of Monar H-beam connecting rods. They are six inches, eight hundred thousandths long and have a two inch, two hundred thousandths big block Chevy size big end. And then the whole assembly is installed in the block where the crank has already been dropped in place. The block is an original small journal 389 casting that Dorton sourced. Unfortunately, the previous owner had managed to lose the main caps, so Dorton did the machine work required to install a set of new billet steel four bolt main caps from Billet Speedworks. This engine will wind up in a show car, so all that roughness and casting slag has already been painstakingly ground smooth with Lord only knows how many sanding rolls and gallons of elbow grease. The car builder, Johnson's Hot Rod Shop, will be applying a multi-stage paint job to the engine to suit the car, so it will stay in bare metal for the build and dyno session. In the old days, the larger 400 and up cubic inch Pontiac blocks were more sought after because it was easier to make power. But these days, a modern aftermarket stroker crank makes the Small Journal 389 a better choice. The 389 uses a smaller three inch diameter main journal versus three and a quarter inch mains, which reduces parasitic losses. So, Dorton is using a forged crank from Monar that utilizes the smaller main journals while also bumping up the stroke to the previously mentioned four and a quarter inches. A deck height of 10.24 inches allows the easy combination of that much stroke along with a tall six inch 800 thousandths long connecting rod, which helps maintain a good rod stroke ratio. By the way, check out the oil pump pickup bolted to the Melling oil pump. This design moves the pickup directly over the oil pump to squeeze it just a little bit closer to the back of the pan, which helps ensure the pickup doesn't become uncovered during hard launches. The camshaft is from Crane. It's a hydraulic roller that's been ground to match up well with the higher flowing heads that we'll be using. At 50 thousandths tap it lift, it has 247 degrees of duration for the intakes and 255 for the exhausts. Lobe lift is 360 thousandths for the intakes and 372 thousandths for the exhaust. Combined with the 1.65 to 1 ratio crane rocker arms we'll be using, and that makes total valve lift 594 and 614 thousandths respectively. The cam is spun by the crankshaft via a billet double roll timing chain. You will notice that the front of the engine has no dowel pins to help locate the front cover, so a few precautions must be taken. If the front cover isn't properly positioned, that means the front seal won't be centered around the crank snout and damper hub, and that extra pressure on one side or the other of the seal means it will fail prematurely. To keep that from happening, Dorton uses just a couple of bolts to hold the front cover to the block, but leaves them loose. He then partially installs the hub off the ATI damper he'll be using onto the crank. 
If you're using a stock damper, it doesn't have to be disassembled. Just press it on far enough that it extends past the seal. Then make sure nothing is bound up and the front seal is resting gently on the damper snout and you can finish bolting up the front cover. And here's a shot with the ATI damper on and secured to the crank. The oil pan has also been bolted up. This is a Pro Touring Pontiac pan from Mylodon. I came by too late to show you the inside, but it's fully baffled with trap doors to hold oil around the pickup no matter how hard the driving gets. This pan can handle a stroke of up to four and a half inches and holds seven quarts of oil. A pair of Cometic multi-layer steel head gaskets are used to provide a proper seal between the deck of the block and the Edelbrock Performer RPM cylinder heads we'll be using. Edelbrock says their Performer RPM heads for Pontiacs are based on the Ram Air 4 Pontiac head between 1969 and 70. These particular heads have 72 cc combustion chambers combined with 215 cc intake runners. But it's worth noting that Automotive Specialist has hand ported these heads for increased airflow and that means the chamber size will be a few cc's larger. These 14 degree heads are designed to produce best power from 1500 to 6500 RPM. The stainless steel valves are from Ferreira and sized at 2 inches 110 thousandths for the intakes and 1 inch 660 thousandths for the exhaust, both with an 11 32 inch valve stem. Pontiac's block design has a very thick deck for great strength. Only 10 bolts are used to clamp each cylinder head to the block, but each is a half inch ARP bolt that's torqued to 100 foot pounds, so the clamping load is actually quite high. Also, all the bolt holes are blind, so none intrude into water jackets, which is always nice. These valves are actuated by a set of springs from PAC. They are a nested double spring with a damper in between and have an installed height of 1 inch 900 thousandths. With the valves against the seat, they produce 145 pounds of pressure, and at maximum valve lift, they will be pulling back with a force of 435 pounds. Those unique looking valve spring retainers are titanium Manly Super 7s. Manly doesn't make them anymore, and they were mostly used for NASCAR Cup racing. But this is just the sort of thing that you never know when Dorton will pull out of his bag of tricks. Like the camshaft, the lifters are also from Crane. These are hydraulic rollers designed to retrofit directly into the Pontiac block, which never originally came with rollers. The tall bodies on these lifters means they can handle lots of lift without banging one of the steel tie bars into a lifter bore. Next, Dorton installs the two-piece pushrod guide plates and 7 16 inch rocker studs. Before tightening down on the rocker studs, which secure the guide plates in place, he mocks up everything, including pushrods and rocker arms. Then he can adjust the guide plate position so that the pushrod doesn't rub against the pushrod holes in the cylinder heads and the tip of the rocker arm is centered over the top of the valve stem as much as possible. This is possible because the hardened guide plates come in two pieces and the bolt holes are slotted, allowing a little movement for adjustment. As part of the checking process, he also verified proper pushrod length to make sure that the rocker arm sweep is centered over the top of the valve stem. We wound up using 5 16 inch hardened pushrods that are 8 inches 750 thousandths long. With everything verified, the aluminum crane rocker arms can be installed. Instead of the usual 1.5 to 1 ratio rocker arms, these are a more aggressive 1.65 ratio for both the intakes and exhaust. So net lift will be 594 thousandths for the intakes and 614 thousandths for the exhaust. Dorton sets up the valves by tightening up the adjuster nut until all the lash is removed and then runs it down an additional three quarters of a turn which depresses the hydraulic cup in the lifter approximately 40 thousandths of an inch. Then he locks everything down. When Dorton started planning this build, the idea was to put together a really high horsepower Pontiac with lots of cubic inches and a single plane intake manifold with dual four barrel carbs to feed it plenty of air and fuel. But along the way, the owner had a change of heart and decided he wanted a more retro look even if it cost him some horsepower. So this intake will be used instead. The aluminum casting from Pontiac Tri-Power is based on a 1966 Pontiac intake for a triple two-barrel carb setup. Except for this build, we'll be using fuel injection. 
This dual plane intake is an older design and it certainly won't be able to flow as much air as the setup Dorton had originally planned on, but you gotta admit it's still pretty cool. The fuel injection setup is from AutoTrend EFI and it obviously has been designed for the throttle bodies to mimic the look of old school Rochester two barrels. All three throttle bodies are fully CNC cut and each one is rated at 350 CFM which is a lot better than the stock Rochester, which flowed only around 278. Each unit is outfitted with a pair of 42 pound injectors. The system, however, does have a unique method for mounting up. It turns out the base plates and their corresponding bolt holes are narrower than the carburetor mounting flanges on the intake manifold. To get around it, the AutoTrend EFI system uses these offset bolts. The bolts thread into the manifold, but they don't have to be tight. Once they're in place, a set of spacers go down. The spacers have slotted bolt holes that are machined to fit exactly over the shoulders of the offset bolts so they can actually fit flat against the intake manifold and not be held off any. After another gasket drops in place, the fuel injection bodies can be mounted up. Because the spacer plate fits over the shoulder of the offset bolts, once the throttle bodies are bolted down, they seal the plates and the gaskets and create a leak-free system. And because everything will be computer controlled, actually we're using a Holly ECU specifically, there's no need for complex progressive throttle linkages like you normally see with a carbureted system. It's actually a pretty sweet setup. And with that, it's time to take this poncho to the dyno and see what she's capable of. As you can see, all three throttle bodies are fed through a common, if sort of small, fuel log. We gave them a constant 60 pounds of fuel pressure and they were happy. The car builder and owner are working on machining some custom valve covers for this engine and they weren't ready yet, so Dorton pulled these stamp pieces off of a shelf. They aren't pretty, but for now all we need them to do is to keep the oil on the inside of the engine. Also not very pretty are the headers and their funky collector arrangement we're using, but these are just dyno headers. They have a two inch pipe diameter and while the collector design may not be the most efficient in the world, it won't hurt much, if at all. So how did it do? Not too bad. This 461 makes plenty of torque to get the 55 Safari station wagon it'll be going into moving on down the road. Dorton pulled from 3800 RPM to 5500. The torque comes on strong early with a peak of 544.2 foot-pounds at 3,900 RPM and it never drops below 500 all the way up until 5,100 RPM. Because of the intake manifold, we knew this engine wasn't going to be a high rever, but that's not what it was intended to be anyway. We nearly broke the 500 horsepower mark with a peak of 487.9 horsepower at 5,400 RPM and average horsepower throughout the entire pull was a healthy 454.7. With plenty of torque on demand throughout the RPM range and a highly controlled fuel injection system that should make this engine crank on the first shot any time of year, this mill is going to be a lot of fun. And hey, I can get behind anyone that wants to keep classic Pontiac V8s alive. If you've made it this far, my sincere thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe because we've got tons more great builds coming up.